we've divided this uh, presentation into two parts. Uh, somehow I got demagogue and she got dead. She gets the more beautiful aspect of it, but as she was sort of saying, she was kind of jealous. She was like, you get the more exciting aspect. Uh, so we'll be talking about a rather controversial figure. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce him first by telling you a little bit about him. And then hopefully, let's see if this is working. There we go. Uh, I'll introduce you to this fellow and the connection to radio as well. Um, for those of you who don't immediately recognize this, uh, I was going to say gentleman, but I'll say this individual up on the screen, this is Father Charles Hovland. Uh, he was a, a born in Canada um, in October 25th, 1891. And he actually graduated from St. Michael's College in Toronto in 1911. And he attended the St. Basil Seminary also in Toronto. Uh, it's important that we know a little bit about his character uh, uh, before we go into what made him uh, famous or infamous in this country. Um, the Basilians um, were a certain sect of the Roman Catholic Church that looked towards the Middle Ages um, in theologically. And that's important because one of those things that they looked towards was the stance on anti-usury, the idea of charging interest. They, they thought that was a terrible thing and the source of all of modern problems today and the problems with capitalism and, you know. So this is something that he was trained in from the very beginnings, is, is with this idea that usury is a terrible thing and should be eliminated. Uh, in 1923, the Brazilians reorganized. And part of that reorganization was they went from regular Diocesan priests to monastic orders, where they had to embrace the poverty, chastity, and obedience uh, vows. That was, not, that was a little more than he signed on for. I'm not sure which of the vows wrote the, wrote the longest. I, I personally suspect it was the poverty one, though, and we'll get into that uh, as we get into his character uh, in a little bit. So he actually dropped out of that order, crossed uh, into the United States in the neighborhood of Detroit, and then found himself after a few years in 1926 uh, forming a new congregation of about 25 Catholic families in the suburbs outside of Detroit, a little place called um, uh, Royal Oaks. And there he founded the, the uh, Shrine of the Little Flower. Uh, when he was there, he had a little bit of a problem with the Ku Klux Klan. Um, the Ku Klux Klan was not happy about having any Catholics in the neighborhood, and so they drawn some crosses in front of the church hoping to get them to leave, and he did not leave. Uh, so our first encounter with him is kind of a, more of a heroic kind of thing. We think, oh great, someone who stood up to the Ku Klux Klan, and I do have somewhere here, if I can. But what we're going to see here is his recreation of his conflict with the Ku Klux Klan. And it's interesting that he did this kind of recreation because he sort of portrays himself as this heroic figure. And let's take a look. Now we're seeing the radio tower of uh, the shrine that he built. That's that's what it's like.
good shot up there. So I, I found it interesting to uh, to show that little clip because that was done ten years after the actual events happened. And if you watch it, it's a very dramatic kind of film. Uh, I mean, you could expect that kind of Hollywood noir kind of element to it, with the background music swirling, and he comes running out of the office and helps kick down the, the burning cross. And, and I think this is interesting to sort of see how he presents himself to the public uh, as this heroic figure. Um, we'll see some less heroic aspects of, of his uh, career in, in a bit now. Um, so, after his conflict with the KKK, he started construction of uh, a great structure that will be described by my colleagues, so I'm not going to steal any of her thunder. Needless to say, he just described it as the cross they cannot burn. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting thing. We'll see this huge tower of concrete. Uh, so this was his sort of response to KKK intimidation. Now, really came to be an important figure after 1929 and the stock market crash. Uh, at that point, he starts to get very political. And he needs to earn some money to support the building of this uh, really this large church that he's building that's going to serve a congregation originally of 500 people, no more than that. Uh, but he really has lots of ambitions. So he starts doing some radio broadcasts. He becomes so popular that he's picked up by CBS and broadcast nationwide in 1931. Uh, he's reaching, at the height of his uh, power, one third of Americans are listening to him. 30 million regular listeners. And then after, uh, he starts to include a lot of anti-Semitic tropes in his talks, talking about so-called internationalist bankers. That was kind of code word for saying Jewish bankers. And, and he starts getting into a lot of the sort of conspiracies. And he's staunchly anti-communist implies that many Jews are either capitalist exploiters or communist exploiters, and he starts going really towards the right along those lines. But again, he's got a large following. Uh, CBS decides to say, well, we want to read all of your sermons before you go on the air. And he says, no way, so they pull him. But in response to that, he says, fine, I don't need you. And he actually works with a syndicate of something like 31 stations around the globe, so he still has a national reach. He is so important in 1932 that someone like uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had to be careful not to offend him and even to do a little bit of courting of him to try and get his votes. And in fact, Father Parkland uh, claimed that he coined the phrase Roosevelt or ruin. He also uh, claimed to have come up with another of the campaign slogans. The New Deal is Christ's deal. So this is when he's at the height of his popularity. He starts parting with Roosevelt on a couple of issues, the main one being silver. And I'll get into why that's important. He feels we should be taken off the gold standard, we should introduce silver, and that will solve all the monetary problems of the Great Depression in one quick and easy stroke. Uh, Roosevelt's kind of like, yeah, that's nice, but I don't think so. At this point, he's investing in silver stocks. So he, had a, he kind of had a personal stake in this. And not only is he pushing Roosevelt behind the scenes, he literally also testifies before Congress. Here he is testifying before Congress, uh, trying to get them to get off the gold standard and to adopt silver, which would have helped him enormously financially as well. <clears throat> In some ways, though, he was just drawing on an older progressive populist ticket, the old silverites uh, of the of the earlier era, and in fact, he echoed uh, the Democratic candidate for uh, 1896, uh, William Jennings Bryant, who had said, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns 
you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of rhetoric that he's using. He and Roosevelt start to part ways, and by 1934, they've become disenchanted with one another. By 1935, he is now against Roosevelt, and whereas he said Roosevelt or ruin, it's now Roosevelt and ruin, and he starts supporting alternative candidates like the governor of, uh, and then senator of Louisiana, uh, Howie uh, Pierce uh, Long. And, and he stopped supporting him in 1935 until his assassination in 35 ended his presidential candidacy. Then he looked over towards uh, William Lemke and, uh, and the Union Party as a third party alternative uh, to the Democrats and the Republicans. At this point, he goes really over the edge into right wing politics. He supports the Christian Front before the FBI raids that organization and kind of dismantles it. Uh, he starts hanging out with people like Henry Ford, who was an extreme anti-Semite and publishing in his uh, Dearborn uh, weeklies all sorts of nasty anti-Semitic materials that were circulated internationally and actually influenced Adolf Hitler. Uh, he really starts putting in a lot more anti-Semitic stuff, not using the code words and just outright coming out with lots of anti-Semitic rhetoric uh, to the point where the FBI starts investigating him. When World War II breaks out, he's firmly isolationist, saying that the Jews have engineered the war. He wants the U.S. to stay out of it. And at that point, they provoke his uh, ability to go on the radio. Uh, so he's done that way, and they threaten to cut off his postal service so that he's no longer able to uh, uh, send out his social justice magazine anymore. So this is the man we're talking about. Let's just see a, a few more images here. We have some great images in the Wolfsonian collection caricaturing uh, him. And I love this image in particular. Uh, you all know the expression, the eyes are the windows to the soul? Notice anything yeah. funny here? No eyes. Yeah, he's got these uh, glasses on that make him, uh, you know, completely hollow, so no soul at all is implied. Uh, here he is, he's obviously showing his radio, uh, and Christianity seems much smaller than the fact that it's all about him being a radio uh, polemicist. And Notice something strange about his suit. On the one side, it's the priestly corset. On the other side, it's a business suit. And he's got a big money bag in his hand. This was an illustration by Hugo Gellert. Hugo Gellert was the main artist of the Communist Party of the United States of America. So he wanted to show the world that this guy is just a dangerous demagogue, and despite him posing as a sort of champion of the working class, he's nothing more than a charlatan who's there for your money. In fact, at the height of the Great Depression, he was receiving something like 80,000 letters a week, and he would tell, he actually, he was the one who started the whole televangelism. Before televangelism, it was radio vandalism. <laughs> I like that, vandalism, radio vandalism. Uh, I think I've formed a new word for today. Um, he actually, as I mentioned, reached about 30 million listeners, but he was also telling them to send envelopes with a couple of dollars, whatever they could spare, to him so he could help end the Great Depression and invest in silver uh, and build his church and fund his radio and fund his hateful... Uh, Social Justice Magazine. Uh, he was raking in approximately $50,000 a week in the Great Depression. That's a lot of money in the Great Depression. Uh, and again, since it's all coming in in bills, who knows exactly how much was coming in. That's how much he was reporting to the IRS. So, uh, let's go on to another image. Here we have Father Coffin lecturing Jesus on the cross. I think that's hilarious. But notice, this is again Hugo 
Abram Gellert is 60 pieces of silver, right? So he's picturing him as Judas Iscariot, who is actually the betrayer of Christ. And again, making sure that everyone remembers this guy is taking your money to invest in silver for his own personal profit. This uh, image here includes four figures. These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, according to Hugo Gellert. On the far left, no, they're all far right, according to Gellert. Right. On the left, we have Hugh Johnson, who is in charge of uh, the National Recovery Administration, the old LRA. Then we have uh, Hearst, William Randolph Hearst, uh, who was obviously a right wing um, a newspaper mogul. Huey Long, uh, there with a sort of Ku Klux Klan outfit, uh, wielding uh, shackles. And on the far right, uh, I guess as it should be, is Father Coughlin uh, with a little radio uh, microphone. Uh, side. Uh, so, really quite clever imagery. And this last piece, just to show that it wasn't just the far left uh, communists who were uh, looking at Coughlin with uh, uh, some sort of satire, here we have another one by an anti New Dealer who wrote, This is the priest all shaven and shorn, who is yapping and yapping from night until morn. This is the priest of the vast radio who grins at the mic and just lets himself go. This is the priest who left faith in the lurch to preach to the state instead of the church. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague who will tell you about a beautiful building that he built with all that money coming in. <laughs> None of the surrounding areas were built up. 
Um, as, as, uh, as Frank said, this was a, a, a parish of, of really 25 to 35 families when it was established. Um, so it was, it was quite small and this building was quite large. Um, I also, though, uh, want to share that story because I have been preoccupied by this building ever since I lived there. Um, it is uh, unmistakable, unmissable, as I said. And um, it was in trying to figure out what this church even was, what community it belonged to, who, who had built it. That's actually how I first found out about Father Coughlin. And so for me, the two are, are, are in, inexplicably linked, or in, inextricably linked, rather. And, and that is, I think, true for, for the community as well. Um, and in doing the research on this, on this project and into the building, which was such a, a great joy for me as someone who passed it every day to finally be able to at least digitally enter the building um, and figure out, wrap my, try to wrap my brain, so my brain around it. Um, I had the chance to speak for almost four hours with various members of the community, and in particular with um, one gentleman who gave a lot of his time and energy to me. Um, and uh, he said something that I want to say to all of you before I dive into the architecture, because um, uh, they have, as a community, I think, really struggled with the legacy of Father Coughlin. It's a, it's a really hard thing to be um, a, a believer of a religion and to have um, a, a real spiritual sense of your role in this world and also understand that your community was established by, by a man with this ideology. And so he said something that really uh, resonated with me that I just wanted to briefly share before we dive in, uh, which is that uh, he said in an email, we recognize that this church was built by Father Coughlin, but does not honor him. And I think that's a really lovely idea. And from everything I've seen, and certainly from my conversations with them, I think that they are living up to that idea. And also, the very architecture of this building reflects uh, Coughlin's relationship to it, and Coughlin's history, and Coughlin's role in building it. And so that's some of what I want to explore. The deco history of this building, the kind of aesthetics of the building, but also the way that uh, Coughlin is wrapped up in it, and frankly, that the radio is wrapped up in it. So, with that long preamble, let's dive in. Um, so Frank has told the story of the establishing of this community, and this is the original uh, church building, which I think we can agree is much better suited to a community of 35, or at this point, 25 families in 1926 when the, when the church is established. Um, it was called the, uh, the Shrine of the Little Flower. It was named for um, St. Teresa of Lizot, who was uh, known as the Little Flower of Jesus. She had, been she had been canonized just the year before. So um, often if you come across a church, a Catholic church called the Little Flower, um, it's a good guess that it was probably built within a couple of years of her canonization. Um, this is the interior of the church. You can see this very, very modest, very reasonably scaled sanctuary. Um, and this is the rectory, so this is where, uh, where Coughlin would have lived. Um, and uh, uh, this is all published in a souvenir book in 1936, which was published in honor of, of the new building. Um, as, as Frank alluded to, though, you know, within a year of the community being established, uh, the KKK is making themselves known. Um, the KKK was reborn in 1915 on Stone Mountain, which is in Georgia. Um, it's the largest freestanding freeze, and it has uh, the Confederate generals on it. It's a fascinating <laughs> piece of artwork. Um, and so obviously primarily in the South, but also in the North as well. And in Michigan, the resurgence of the KKK was in many ways in response to Catholicism. Um, the KKK was a Protestant organization. And Detroit itself is very Catholic. The northern suburbs of Detroit, on the other hand, we're very Protestant. Um, and so we get the KKK and we get Coughlin's um, declaration that he is going to build, as Frank said, um, a cross that they cannot burn. And that cross will be this new shrine. Um, so we have Father Coughlin here and um, uh, McGill, his architect here. Uh, Henry McGill is the architect of this new building. Um, Coughlin at this point has decided that, uh, that this building must be enormous. It must, it must represent the scale of, of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and it also should reflect the scale of his radio show, which by 1931, which is when they begin building the building, has become, as Frank said, um, you know, one of the most popular radio shows in the country. And so uh, what is so interesting about the final product of the church is that it does not reflect the size of the community that it is positioned in. It reflects the size of this radio community, right, that he has. Um, and so there's a real interesting uh, relationship between the scale of the church and the scale of his audience. Is it the small audience of his parish, or is it this national audience that he's speaking to uh, with the church? Um, uh, I mentioned the Gill because we don't think of Art Deco as 
the prize of, as a real common architectural style for, for churches. Uh, there are not very many Art Deco churches. Obviously, um, a lot of church architecture is looking to the past, and so we see a lot of Gothic architecture, right? We see a lot of um, a lot of sort of federal architecture for Congregationalist churches. Um, but McGill actually built a number of Roman Catholic churches in the Art Deco style, and so I don't I don't want to make it seem like this is his only one. So this is uh, the Church of the Blessed Sacrament in Queens. This is one of his final churches. Um, but there's no question that the altar, of the, the shrine of the little flower, sorry, was was his largest and kind of most uh, uh, major. And we can get a sense of the scale of this project um, from this picture. Um, this is the base of that enormous tower, and this is the top of the crucifix that is going to go at the top of the tower. The tower becomes the name of the tower is the Charity Crucifixion Tower. Um, I think the use of the word charity is really important. <laughs> Uh, in this context, um, much of the church is named or has various decoration that speaks to ideas of charity and goodwill, um, which are obviously very important to Christianity and to Catholicism. And, uh, and uh, I think for the members of the church, it's something that they feel quite strongly that they live out, and Pablo himself kind of complicates um, uh, with, with that. Um, so uh, the building of the church is not just a regional uh, 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 occasion. It is a national occasion. All three of these articles are from the New York Times. Um, not the, and the Detroit News was covering it too, but, but the spread of the building of this church went far beyond that. And so we have 1930 when the building uh, is, is initially planned. Uh, the Shrine to Tolerance replaces Fiery Cross. So you can see that this kind of narrative of Coglin building um, a church that the KKK cannot burn um, uh, is picked up. Uh, then we see in the middle uh, the, the dedication of, of, of the shrine, even though it's not yet complete in 1935, the tower is opened. Um, and then interestingly, the, um, the old church is destroyed by a fire, and uh, right, right when they open the new church. Um, and what is, I think that has been conflated, and so what I, one of the things that I came across a lot in my research was this apocryphal story that the KKK burned down the old church. No, the KKK did not. And, and in the article, it's very clear. It's like, oh, it was a, I think they said it was a, uh, a like, a, yeah, just a, a, um, an accident. So, so, but there's been, you know, fire plays such a role in the establishment of this church in a metaphorical sense, but I think sometimes it gets And you can see these connections and where the Art Deco elements of, of 
nature, um, in the kind of sinuous curves um, that 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 uh, culminate in in those spirals. All of that is is like kind of peak art that though, and we begin to see it manifested on the church. Um, again, even more of this art that comes out. So we have here the tower just to situate us, and then this is the sanctuary, and this is what's called the narthex. Um, I've become a real a real scholar of uh, of church architecture terms in this process, so I'm showing off for you narthex. Um, uh, uh, so we have that kind of that very typical stepped outline that we're so used to in our deco architecture, that telescoping pattern, and it's not just on the windows. You get um, a step and repeat in and out above the windows, you get that same sort of telescoping effect right here on the wall. Um, uh, you see it on the doorway to the, uh, to the tower and uh, into the sanctuary itself. And so that repetition of, of telescoping Art Deco uh, uh, pattern is kind of pure uh, uh, period and um, uh, has this really kind of uh, incredible effect. Sorry, I'm too, there we go. Um, and again, you know, uh, on the right, on, on the right here, we have um, uh, again Chevelin's gates for the Shannon Building, and this is the entrance to the tower. And we see really what I think is the most interesting aspect of applying Art Deco design to a church. Um, so often, Art Deco, when we see it in skyscrapers and in uh, train stations and, and in kind of these, these big buildings, is we think of it as um, the decoration that elevates these buildings to make them temples to industry temples to, to commerce. And here, we get that same effect, that sunburst effect, for an actual temple. It's the application of this idea of the elevating of the industrial, the elevating of commerce, the elevating of, of the modern of modern life that is so much a quality of Art Deco, applied to a very ancient idea, God, religion. Um, when we step inside the church itself, uh, we are now, again, in, in, in the narthex, there's the, the baptismal font right here. Um, back here, it, it's, I apologize for the quality of the image, the, the light, but this is um, actually the small chapel to St. Uh, Teresa of Lizzo. And this is the base of the tower. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find so interesting about this space is that, um, you know, baptismal font aside, when I look at it, I think, oh, that's the lobby to a skyscraper, right? Those are those are elevator doors. That's that's where the that's where you would have the kind of the the dial with the floor numbers you're on, right? And then you look closely and you say, no, those are saints. Um, this is a baptismal font. Uh, that's a that's a chapel. Um, but the the interchangeability almost of of the of the um, aesthetics and the, uh, the the imagery is is fascinating. The baptismal font itself even borrows from some of the aesthetics of Art Deco. This is um, the center of the baptismal font. There is a cross, of course, surrounded by fish, um, but the cross has, you can see, a stepped pattern, and the fish are done in chapelevé enamel, which was a really traditional, like a very popular Art Deco technique um, of metalwork. Uh, and so uh, it, it again sort of reinforces. I mean, you can even imagine you see this 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 uh, grill um, uh, for a. I think an, air, an aircraft, perhaps. Um, you could imagine that in the lobby of the Wilsonian, right, where we have grills from, from our deco buildings in that. We enter the uh, um, the sanctuary itself, and we see the effect of the of the round uh, interior. Um, this altar in the center, and then pews all around. The pews were also made for the building, and you can see that um, uh, McGill's step effect is repeated down here. Um, and then in the center, there is an 18-ton piece of Carrera marble, which is the altar. Um, and above it uh, uh, is the uh, baldachin, another term I had to learn for this, um, which is sort of the canopy. And we'll get a closer image of that uh, right here that has glass, uh, Bavarian glass, sorry, Bohemian glass, and then um, uh, a central uh, de decorative element, which again, I think to me, kind of captures the uh, the interesting marriage of Art Deco and, and religion. Um, you have crosses, obviously. You have the flower for St. Therese, the little flower. But you also have this kind of radiating pattern outward that is so Deco. Um, uh, and and the, kind of the zigzag of the lines all around, it's symmetrical the way we think of Deco ornamentation. Um, and then on the sides, you have similar sort of stepped patterns. And 
so once again, we get this marriage of Deco and, and religion. And I just wanted to quickly show this um, uh, uh, window. This is the inside, obviously looking at those same windows that we saw on the outside. But we see again that really wonderful stepped effect. And um, bronze uh, metal, the metal work on the windows are, are bronze, and they're by um, the Moynihan Bronze Company in Detroit. OK, so that's the church. I want to talk a little bit more about the tower in particular. Um, like I said, right around here is where the radio station, the radio broadcasting studio was. Um, there's a spiral staircase that goes up inside. Unfortunately, we have no imagery of what the inside looked like. Um, uh, I, like I said, I had this wonderful, these wonderful conversations with members of the church, and one of them, um, who is a is a kind of an amateur historian, gives tours of the church, knows the history of this building quite well said that um, there's no surviving imagery of the inside of the tower, but he was once invited to go inside, and he walked up the, he walked up the, the spiral staircase, and the inside has all been damaged. Um, when when Coughlin ceased broadcasting, and then eventually he left the church in 1966, dies in 79, they decided to shut the tower off uh, of the heat, turn the heat off in the tower to save money, because no one was using the tower. Um, and then, of course, Unlike, unlike sunny Florida, Detroit gets quite cold in the winter, um, and a pipe burst oh. without uh, heating the space, and it completely flooded the interior of the tower, destroying the inside. Uh, records, church records do show that there was a lot of detailed plaster work in the studio, and um, also mahogany paneling, so it was a very ritzy, luxurious interior. Um, and uh, the people I spoke with at the church do believe that this photo was taken inside uh, in the studio. Um, so we have that image. But one thing that we do know about the way that the radio broadcast worked is the way in which it was in, literally embedded into the architecture of the space. Obviously, the tower was purpose built to be a radio tower, and there is um, a lot of kind of metaphorical meaning behind that, kind of broadcasting from, from above, as well as actual kind of physical a studio within, within the tower. Um, but also, uh, not only would you be able to hear uh, Coughlin on the radio, you could also hear him from the street level because these are speakers. So if you were walking by, if you perhaps came up to, in, to be impressed by this beautiful sculpture work by Shambellan, uh, you might catch a bit of the recording of uh, the broadcast. I don't know if you could hear it from the street. That's a question that I have. If you were driving by with your windows down, but maybe. <laughs> so I want to conclude um, with uh, something that I haven't really resolved for myself, and I, I don't think it is resolvable, which is this question of how this building, which is really kind of a dizzying expression of Art Deco architecture, um, how the people who use this building, admire this building, think about this building, uh, grapple with this its relationship to Father Coughlin. And I think that, the, like I said, the church has done a lot of work, the community has done a lot of work to, to um, come to terms with that relationship and acknowledge his terrible past while also uh, you know, kind of celebrating the building that he built. I think ultimately they can't be separated, um, and that's because Coughlin is kind of built into the fabric of the building. Uh, this is a tile from the exterior. You can see this is from the, the souvenir book that was published. Um, on the exterior of the building, there are these tiles embedded into uh, the surface that represent, that, that depict state flowers um, of all the states in the country where listeners to the radio station donated money from. It's all of them, right? It's all of the states that existed in that moment. Everyone, someone from every state donated. Um, and not only is it just the donors, it's not only is it just the radio station, it's Cotland himself. Um, above the doors to the sanctuary, um, there are uh, each door, there are four doors, and each one has a saint, a relief of a saint um, uh, carved above it. And those are St. Agnes, St. Amelia, St. Thomas, and St. Charles. St. Agnes, Father Coughlin's sister, St. Thomas, Father Coughlin's father, St. Amelia, Father Coughlin's mother, and St. Charles, Father Coughlin himself. Um, those were all the patron saints of the Coughlin family. Um, and so, uh, obviously the church has a life beyond Coughlin. It is an architectural mystery. It's fascinating. It's compelling. It has this, uh, people come to see it. Um, it's a, now, it's a, a 
shrine in the basilica, which means it has a higher status as a church. It's, it's a subject of a great deal of attention. But I, I, but I think fundamentally, um, the, uh, the fame that kicks off the basilica, the, the shrine, I should say, is Coblin's fame, and the two are, are going to be forever linked. Um, and I respect the church for, for trying to, to come to terms with it, but I, I think it's a real challenge. And I, I guess I leave, I leave us on that note of, of how, how does one appreciate this architectural marvel and also uh, um, grapple with, with its history. And I'm looking forward. waning 
greatly after 1934 or so. 32 to 34, he's at the height of his power. After that, he's slowly diminishing as people are listening to him and saying, mm, I don't really agree with this guy on a lot of issues. One of the things that's interesting is that when you read sort of period accounts, it, like those newspaper articles that I was showing, they don't, he's the radio priest, but they don't, they don't say what he's saying in his radio broadcasts. Oh. By the time he's retired, there's an article about him retiring, they're very comfortable sharing, you know, that he was, that his ideologies were, were, were abhorrent. And certainly upon his death, his, his obituary is, is, you know, yep. controversial. Radio well, before that, in the 40s, they actually published a book about propaganda, and they use him as a big example of the dangers of propaganda and fascism in America. Yeah, so, so yeah, he's it, he's kind of found out by the time America enters the war, he's still isolationist and claiming this is a, a Jewish engineered war. That he's pretty, I can easily say he's out of step with the vast majority of the American public after Pearl Harbor, so uh, he, he's on his very way out. You, uh, just a, uh, first of all, great presentations. Question, uh, the relationship between Coughlin and the architect. Did Coughlin just, uh, say, design a building? Were they fighting? <laughs> That's a great question. I, yeah. And then just my second comment, <laughs> and then, then we respond. Looking at that tower, all I could think of was Albert Speer and sort of almost a fascist piece of architecture. Comment on that. Yeah, so um, I don't know what their relationship was like. Uh, that's a great question. McGill is not a particularly famous architect. There's not, um, uh, you know, I was not able to find his papers. Uh, they actually exist oh. somewhere, up, but, uh, you know, uh, that's not research I've been able to uncover. Um, my sense is uh, just from the kind of the the way in which so much of the exterior uh, sculpture work and the, there are kind of quotations on the outside of the buildings, there are quotations on the inside of the buildings, and all of them have to do with the relationship of the church to labor and to this idea of, of usury. My sense is that Coughlin had a great deal of influence on the uh, the look and the feel of the church. Having said that. McGill was an Art Deco church architect, a very strange thing to be. And, uh, and so we see, we see many of the same sort of flourishes that appear in the shrine in some of his other buildings as well. They're just, the buildings are, are a smaller scale. So I think in many ways, probably this was a project where he could kind of flesh out some of his wildest ideas because the budget, I don't know if I mentioned this, the, yes, I did, it cost a million and a half dollars. Um, uh, the tower alone was 250000 So that would have been an enormous amount of money for him to, to, to get to play with. Talking about the Great Depression. Yeah. And as for the sort of fascistic quality of the tower, I mean, yes. <laughs> like, it's, it's, very, it's very hard not to see that. Uh, well, the question for me is whether I see a kind of a fascistic quality because I know Coughlin's ideology. Um, I will say that uh, uh, just sort of... I, I decided on a whim to see if I could, there's not a ton of photography of the interior. Certain parts are very well photographed, others are not. And so on a whim, I went on social media just to see if anyone had taken kind of iPhone photos. And I found a whole kind of thread on Twitter of someone who talks about kind of Catholic fascist imagery, looking at mostly actually the interior sculpture work. And he used the term calf fash, which I had never heard. <laughs> Because Henry Ford ceases his publications in about 1927, and Coughlin picks up just three years later, and they were both of the same strike. So, did Ford influence Coughlin? Okay. So, uh, I, I think absolutely. When we're thinking about it, I mean, he's he's he comes from Canada to Detroit. I mean, this, you're talking the Motor City. I mean, he's in that whole area. Uh, you've mentioned the KKK, and obviously we talked about this adversarial relationship with the KKK. There was another group called the Black Legion. It was a splinter group of the KKK, and it operated in the Midwestern states, 
uh, and it operated kind of working with Ford and some of the other auto industries against union organizers. It, it was cracked down on after they murdered a couple of union organizers who were trying to get into the auto industry and, and so forth. So there was definitely a connection. Ford got in trouble, he got sued, uh, and that was what forced him to stop publishing in the United States. He did, however, uh, take his weeklies, bind them up, and, and distribute them internationally. So Ford remained an anti-Semite along those lines. Cotton um, is interesting because in 1938, in his Social Justice Weekly, he started reprinting some of the protocols of the elders of Zion, the sort of fraudulent world conspiracy of Jews trying to dominate the world. So absolutely, there's that same kind of connection, the same crackpot ideology uh, being peddled. And in fact, uh, towards the end, the reason FDR wanted to really stop the publication of this magazine, it was pro-fascist and pro-Nazi. He became an apologist for Hitler's Kristallnacht by saying, well, yeah, that's terrible, but look what the Russians are doing to all the Catholics in that godless, communist, atheistic country. So, yeah. I guess that's my answer. How, that how close were Ford and Cotton? Uh, I don't know. I, I know that they were associates. I don't know how often they got together, but they definitely knew each other. He also knew Ezra Pound. He also communicated with uh, mostly uh, the uh, founder of the British Union of Fascists in Italy. So, uh, and, you know, he traveled in those scary circles. He was about Yes, and with the Christian Front. Uh, on the, 
the second prize money that he won, the, the money that he received for coming in second for the Chicago Tribune Tower. That's right. <laughs> um, and so Chambellan, who did all of the decorative work on the exterior of, of the church, he, he wasn't the architect of the Tribune building, but he did all of the decorative work on the exterior of the Tribune building as well. So I don't know if, if Sargent was aware of that, but that probably would have burned a, a little. Um, I don't know what they thought of the building. Um, the politics of, uh, of the Booths who founded Cranbrook and of Saarinen are complicated, and uh, uh, so I don't, uh, without going into kind of too much detail, I, I don't know that they would have associated with Coughlin or, or not associated. They were, I think, sort of pretty publicly apolitical in terms of, of thinking about um, uh, Coughlin's sort of public presence. Um, I don't think aesthetically they would have liked it. Just knowing what I know of the Saarinans, I think that it, it, you know, the kind of restrained deco into modernism that you see from Aliel Saarinen, that very kind of Scandinavian, yeah. it's about warmth, it's about texture, it's about, uh, it's about um, simplicity. Yeah. You don't see any of that in the church. Um, the church is bombastic. So I think that, I think that they would not have appreciated okay. these things in the church. Thank you. Thank you. That was